Uh, so our first speaker uh, is Edward Hansen. Uh, Edward is a PhD candidate at Duke. Uh, he's working with uh, Dr. Iran Chen in the ECE department. Uh, his research interests are in the intersection of computer architecture and machine learning. And currently his work focuses on sparse and dynamic processing of DNN models. And he's gonna be presenting cascading structured pruning, enabling high data reuse for sparse DNN accelerators. All right, thank you so much for the introduction. All right, so um, before I actually get into the meat of this presentation, I wanted to give a brief history of DNN pruning to get everyone on the same uh, uh, level playing field here. Um, so the gist of it is that we found that DNN weights are found to be very redundant and that there's um, that when you have multiply and accumulates that are near zero, they don't actually significantly influence the computation. So they might as well be zero. Uh, there's actually special regularization terms that are based on some uh, normalizations like L1 and L2 that can influence the weights to prefer these smaller values. And uh, this, has, this work has been extended towards uh, creating structures of uh, uh, sparse uh, weights on the filters. So uh, what these works have found is that unstructured pruning achieves a high accuracy and sparsity, but hardware actually struggles to directly utilize the sparsity without any specialization. And structured pruning has the opposite problem. It tends to uh, either sacrifice accuracy or sparsity, but hardware works really well with it. All right, so here's an outline of the presentation. I'll be going down first the motivation, talking about the algorithm, CSPA, uh, and then have a, a, a brief uh, a mile high view, then talk about the hardware and end with the results. So for the motivation, uh, the first, first and foremost, to keep or not to keep. Sparse uh, skipping DNN accelerators traditional, uh, traditionally cannot know if an input activation is no longer needed. So assuming that we operate in the, uh, uh, the concept of chunks at a time, the uh, and you encounter a pruned weight, that specific activation uh, intersection is, is not needed at the moment, but it might be used in the future. So to motivate this, I'll uh, provide an example on the bottom figure here. Uh, right now we're representing this uh, these, these tensors in the unrolled format using a coordinate tree representation, which is essentially a graphical representation of the uh, CSR or CSC compression. So on the, on the first uh, cycle or first pass, we're operating on the first chunk of, of data that corresponds uh, to the first tile in the coordinate tree representation. Then once we progress towards the next one, the activations that correspond to the middle, uh, middle intersections of this uh, computation are not needed. Now, this is a toy example. Uh, let's assume that our buffer is not large enough to fit the entire input feature map. We have to make a decision. Should we keep these activations or should we get rid of it? So for this example, let's assume that we do get rid of it because we don't know if we need it in the future. So we progress on our computation, all is good. And upon the last pass, we realize, oops, that activation that we got rid of our, uh, from the on-chip buffer, we actually, re we actually really need it now. Now that's a problem because uh, what we found experimentally is that a bulk majority of the energy consumed in these accelerators are actually due to off-chip accesses or refetches of these activations. So um, whenever you uh, do some simulation or, or even some real processing on, on uh, an accelerator, we find that a lot, of this, uh, uh, a lot of this energy is lost refetching the activations. So we're moving on to the algorithm. How can we solve this problem of, un of not knowing when to get rid of the activations? We want to actually make it implicit to the model. So what we mean here is once we, uh, once we reach a pruned intersection, we wanna maintain that pruned intersection till the end of execution. So that means as soon as we hit the pruned intersection, we can get rid of the activations and we no longer need it. Uh, so we get rid of that re refetching cost. In order to actually prune this model, in this kind of behavior, we use group lasso and overlapping regions on, with using the concept of a cascade. So you can see a cas you can consider a cascade to be uh, a point in the unrolled filter, and anywhere um, all these subsequent chunks from uh, of those filters should maintain the same uh, pruning uh, pruning pattern. So we can we can see this in the figure on the right side. Now the reason why we we progress 
in this specific uh, uh, direction is because common data flows like the output stationary and weight, post, uh, weight stationary data flows uh, progress temporally across the output channel dimension. And um, one, one small or one issue that we find immediately upon doing this is we find that we actually over-regularize the latter chunks, which causes them to be unfairly uh, uh, pruned most of the time and might cause accuracy degradation. So we actually scale that regularization term based on the length of each cascade. Now that we have this special pruned structure, we actually uh, found uh, an immediate benefit. We can perform compression in a more efficient manner. So we can actually stack the, sub the subsequent sub rows of these filter tensors uh, on top of each other and simply represent the length of each uh, cascade by an integer. So this is a, a more efficient way that we can uh, uh, compress the, the tensor. Um, and then this, uh, this can be further extended to, to fit the data flow in the hardware by reformatting the layout uh, uh, correspondingly. Now, that was a, a brief introduction of the algorithm. For more details, please refer to the paper, but I'll be moving on to the mile high view before we talk about what can we do at the hardware level. At the mile high view, there's three things that we want to do. First is we want to recycle these activations until they're no longer needed on chip. That way we can enforce a one-time read uh, behavior. Second, we actually want to decouple utilization from the sparsity pattern. This is a problem in many accelerators because even if they're structured sparse, you end up having a workload imbalance depending on the, spar uh, the, the sparsity rate of certain chunks compared to others. Third, we also want to minimize the data movement of the partial sums. So uh, for the case of our study, we want to actually keep them internal to each PE. There's two main behaviors that we've outlined. The first is the follower leader, uh, the leader follower pipeline. So this is a very straightforward kind of example. Let's assume that we extend the concept of a PE array and we have multiple of them, uh, multiple subarrays. So as soon as one PE array is done uh, computing with, with the activations, we can actually forward it to the next logical rows of the next PE array. Uh, however, there's two main issues with this approach. First is that uh, because of, uh, we're not guaranteeing a specific structure across the rows, there are going to be a chance that we need uh, access to the global buffer on the consecutive PE array. So this might uh, cause a linear growth in our bandwidth requirement. Second is, as we see um, from the bottom part of the left figure, uh, some rows are, tend to be much, much larger than others. So we end up having this workload imbalance problem, which is not what we want. So the second approach here is on the right side, which uh, is in the, uh, what we end up going with. So I'll, I'll discuss that in the future here. Now moving on to the cascading hardware. So the term that we use for our data flow is quite, old, quite loaded. It's input pseudo output stationary. Now, the reason for this is actually because at its heart, it is essentially an output stationary data flow, but with some key modifications to it. So for the first few pass, uh, for the first few cycles, it looks very much like an output station there, a output stationary data flow. But as soon as the data progresses through uh, the systolic, this, um, the array in a systolic fashion, we can actually choose to recycle the activations uh, and in preparation for the next chunk of filters. Now the issue is we need to make sure that the the partial sums are are aligned properly. Uh, so that's something that we will discuss in in the hard microarchitectural details. And um, the, the benefit, the main benefit of this is that rather than having a complex sparse skipping logic to prune these uh, ineffective uh, computations, we can actually do an early stop method for the partial sums. The PE design is shown here. Uh, essentially, uh, we want to maintain a sequential axis of the input and partial sums to avoid the random uh, accesses and avoid ha having to stall for off chip access. And uh, we've actually found that the more efficient structure to hold these partial sums are circular register bins. Uh, originally, if you, were to, if you wanted to hold the partial sums, it needs to be at maximum precision. So assuming we have 8-bit precision inputs, you'd need about 30 to 32 bits for each partial sum. This is a problem because now we're, we're hosting all the partial sums in each PE and might explode in terms of our footprint and power consumption. So, we actually want to maintain 8-bit partial sum precision, but that actually degrades the accuracy dramatically. We found experimentally, however, if you uh, accumulate a certain number of partial sums at full precision before you truncate it, the accuracy, deg accuracy degradation uh, can be almost completely nullified. Now, I'm going to go into detail about, why, about how we structure these uh, registers. 
Um, the reason why we chose a circular uh, buffer is because we're, we're now accessing the partial sums uh, in, in a sequential format. So there's no need to do a, uh, like a register file where we need to arbitrarily access each input. Um, in order to understand why we put these into bins, I'm giving a working example here. Let's say for the first computation pass, we only access the very first chunk, very first partial sum. Then we don't need to do anything because we, it's already at the head of the buffer. We can just simply do a read, modify, write. However, in the worst case scenario, we only access the second uh, chunk of a specific register bin, which means we need to fully rotate it so that by the next time we need that uh, register bin, the head will be at the front. So let's say that we're gonna access partial sum three. So we, we progress to uh, chunk one, then it moves on to register bin two and register bin one uh, recycles and uh, resets. Then we hit register bin three. This is a critical point because let's say we move on to the next filter row where we need to hit register bin two uh, or chunk two in the, in the future. So we go back to zero, move on to one. And meanwhile, register bin one is continuing its circulation. And by the time we need register bin two, it's available to us. So this is why we restructure we structure these register bins in a exponential format. Now that's a, a brief overview of the uh, I guess how we structure the uh, PE. Now to move on to the results. Um, all of our results are simulated by either with uh, in-house simulation or with uh, a, a combination of time loop and scale sim. Uh, so there's certain const constraints that we want to make sure to have a fair comparison. First of all, we need to make sure that the total compute resources and global memory is, con is constant across the accelerators because they tend to uh, influence the efficiency and performance um, pretty much constant across accelerators. There are some variation in this, however. There are parts that we don't want to modify, such as the local memory and local microarchitecture, because doing so will change uh, what is the original author's attention for these uh, for the for the low level details. Uh, so instead of of compare of making sure that we have a total uh, uh, con constant amount of resources across the architecture, we actually compare the number of bytes per Mac uh, across the accelerators just to see uh, because it it uh, essentially shows the storage efficiency, which translates to area and power efficiency down the line. So because we're influencing the trading procedure, the first and foremost uh, issue that we have to face is making sure that accuracy is not degraded significantly. And so we show this in the, in the figure on the right side here, across the various uh, networks that we've uh, trained, we see accuracy degradation of less than 0.5%, and actually in some cases, an improvement in accuracy. Uh, meanwhile, our sparsity rate uh, reaches between 50 and about typically between 70 to 80%, which is typical for structured sparse works. The other uh, result here is that we show that, that with periodic trump, partial sum truncation, we can actually achieve a negligible accuracy loss of about 0.03% uh, when the period is greater than 64 or equal to 64. Now the end-to-end -end results. Mm, long story short, our uh, method has it basically dominates energy efficiency by completely eliminating the activation refetches. So this is, uh, this is actually shown on the bottom of the figure here with the light green bars. The light green bar shows the amount of energy wasted by these accelerators, re refetching data, uh, input data that has been already on the chip in a previous time step. And that's exactly where most of our energy saves are coming from. Now for the sources of speed up, that's a little bit more indirect. Uh, there's two main sources. One is that we can mitigate the off-chip access stalls by enforcing the sequential uh, ordering and also by avoiding refetching the activation redundantly. And the second one is we can decouple the utilization from sparsity, uh, basically uh, making sure that our workload is, is balanced throughout execution. All right, and now here's uh, some more, uh, um, more nuanced details for experiments. Our uh, custom PE design is actually significantly, lar significantly larger than the bare bones Mac PE. So if you focus your attention on, on the bottom left figure here, we show a vanilla systolic array and the essentially the amount of energy wasted uh, by refetching the inputs 
And by just using our method, we can significantly reduce the amount of energy wasted on, on refreshing inputs. But the PE array suddenly becomes a big part of the energy consumption. Um, so what happens if we replace the 32-bit partial sums or register bins with 8-bit? Now we can actually get, uh, we can recover much of that cost. And by in incorporating this intermediate register, which is, uh, which, uh, is used for these, the, par the partial sum, um, periodic partial sum truncation, we can further lower the register bin switching activity and, for and save more power. And the, the last optimization I'll, I'll go over here is actually we, we apply reg register bin clock gating because we find that due to our behavior or sparsity pattern, the latter chunks, which tend to be more expensive in, in terms of access because those correspond to the larger register bins, are less frequently used. So we show on the graph on the right side here through across various um, models, the frequency of access towards the latter chunks the, um, drops to near zero about a register bin three and four. And we show the average amount of power that we save per PE by doing this technique. And that is my presentation. Thank you. Um, questions? So if you have questions, you can just raise your hand or come uh, here and ask. And uh, if you raise your hand, I'll try and come and give the mic to you. So maybe let me get this started. Uh, great talk, Edward. So I have a question. Um, so it seems like your uh, like given the amount of on-chip storage you have, right? Like if I understood correctly, you're kind of training the model in a way that you will fit the activations and never have to refetch them. So I kind of want to understand the extreme cases. What if you had very, very finite on-chip storage? Would you then get to a point where you will start having accuracy losses? Uh, like, is there some minimum amount of storage you need in order for this technique to work? So yes, that is uh, one, one uh a uh, weakness that might be faced is actually if we encounter really wide layers in the network, then essentially they can be larger than the amount of resources we have to, to store the partial sums. But that doesn't necessarily impact our accuracy. It actually causes us to have to refetch the partial sums from off chip, uh, which is a cost that, you know, if we, if you do that uh, constraint to any other accelerator, they'll have to face that kind of issue too. Um. So great work, Jamie from Georgia Tech. I have two questions. Yeah, so first one is you mentioned that you are, you are doing the sparse computation. So may I ask what is the overhead of your sparse control? And the second question is, uh, at the time we are fetching some, you know, we already used some input with already fetched several distance before uh, and then stored them on chip. We don't need to fetch them again from off chip. So what is the distance, maximum distance you will uh, kind of fetch and reuse for the input activation? Thanks. Yeah, so the first question is, what is the overhead of your sparse control? Yeah, we, yeah, yeah, thanks. Actually, that's a very exciting question because the, very, the, the overhead of the sparse control is what we targeted in the first place. The reason why we wanted to have this sequential access and using an early stop method rather than a complex sparse skipping one is we can actually remove tons of the area footprint and power leakage that's, that uh, normally comes with using content addressable memory to find non-zeros. And uh, forgive me, I, I need you to restate the second question. I think it was about um, the, the distance, maybe. Oh, the, the distance between uh, the use of activations. Uh, I see, I see. That is actually dependent on the uh, resources we have for a specific row of PEs. So if we have enough, um, if you want to throw more re re uh, resources to, to buffering the input activations, you could potentially increase the number uh, of activations you hold within a single row uh, linearly or corresponding to that. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? We have time for another quick question if somebody has one. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so a uh, really quick question. Um, if I read your table correctly, I saw that your result for AlexNet was a little incongruent from your other results. So what was the reason for that? That's a good observation too. So actually we struggled really hard to get a, a high uh, compression rate while also preserving the accuracy on AlexNet. We have some theories as to why. And uh, the first one is that AlexNet differs from other models in that it has a really large kernel size on the first layer. 
and uh, that might influence how uh, when we when we encounter uh, when we use our um, periodic partial sum truncation, it might uh, you know more more severely degrade the accuracy there. Thanks, Edward. Let's thank the speaker again. So we'll move on to the next talk now. Uh, you can start setting up. So our next talk uh, is from Jonathan Liu. Uh, so Jonathan is a second year PhD student at the University of British Columbia. Uh, he's being advised by Tor Amit. Uh, his research interests are in accelerators and systems for machine learning and robotics. Yeah, so, so Jonathan's talk is going to be on anticipating and eliminating redundant computations in accelerated sparse training. Can you hear me? Can we make sure we turn off this mic? Okay. All right. Good. Um, thank you for the introduction to chart. Um, I'd like to present this work uh, by collaborators from the University of British Columbia. So while a lot of uh, work has focused on sparse inference, such as uh, the work that you just heard, um, our work is focused on accelerating sparse training. What I'm gonna show you is that when trying to exploit sparsity, sorry, is there, huh? Oh, okay, I'll use the other mic. Okay. Hello? 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 Okay. All right. So while a lot of work has focused on accelerating sparse inference, such as the previous talk, in this talk, I want to discuss our work on accelerating sparse training. So what I'm going to show you is that when trying to exploit sparsity in training, a form of non-zero redundant, um, redundant computation occurs that needs to be addressed. And I'll be uh, describing our solution. I'll start with an executive summary before going into some more details. So this long scale plot shows uh, a variety of deep neural networks and uh, the flops versus the year. And the trend is a five order of magnitude increase in the amount of training compute required in just six years. And so this has been driven by larger and deeper neural networks that have allowed things like AlphaGo Zero uh, to beat the world champion in a game called Go. And so our work is a specialized architecture that attempts to help address this training compute demand. I'll be focusing in this talk on convolutional neural network training, but there are details on sparse matrix multiplication which uh, can benefit from the same technique and the details can be found in the paper. Now the most uh, compute intensive part of uh, CNN training is this convolution between the activation gradient and the activation. And that produces the weight gradient here. Now this convolution operation, which I represent with this uh, asterisk, 
basically does a sliding of the activation gradient across the activation. And at each uh, step, we're doing multiply accumulates to produce each element of the weight gradient. I'll give you an example here. The non-zero uh, uh, computation that has to happen creates this negative two and negative six, and that sums up together to produce the negative eight. Now you might see a lot of the sparsity in this example, and we don't want to compute by zero. And so we chose to use an architecture, which I'll motivate later, uh, which uh, is called outer product, also known as Cartesian product. And so the idea of that is to take the non-zero values from each of the matrices, line them up like so, and then compute every product between them. And then once we do that, we select the values that we need and then accumulate them to produce the output of the convolution. So the example here is uh, we pull out the negative six and negative two from uh, before, and then that produces the negative A. Now you might be wondering about these extra products here. So what are they doing? So it turns out they're actually useless. They don't contribute to the output of the convolution. And so we, can, we call these redundant Cartesian products. And this is the problem that we're trying to solve. It turns out that during sparse training, this uh, actually dominates and is a huge inefficiency that we have to address. I'll give you a breakdown of the, the computation during inference and compare that to training. So during inference, there's a lot of uh, zero computation right here. And as we know, the outer product is only computing non-zero computation. So that automatically gets eliminated. And what's left is a lot of useful computation, um, but a little bit of RCP. Now the real challenge is during this phase of training, which I'll show here. So again, we can eliminate the zero computation and what's left is predominantly redundant Cartesian products. So this, uh, this is a huge amount of redundant computation. And so we designed an anticipated accelerator to then eliminate this computation and only compute uh, mainly this useful computation here. So that's what our accelerator does. And uh, we tested this on a variety of CNNs and that got about 3.7x speed up and it uses about 4.4x less energy. Uh, so for the rest of the talk, I'll talk about the type of sparsity that we see uh, during training, followed by characteristics of redundant Cartesian products, which we'll exploit in our anticipatory accelerator, uh, followed by some discussion of the results. Uh, so convolutional neural network training is composed of three phases. Uh, the first one is called forward pass, and it's actually the same operation as uh, inference. Uh, the next phase is uh, backward pass. This computes the weight gradient. That's what I was talking about earlier. And uh, what's uh, unique is that there are these very large matrices here. And there's a, finally, there's the uh, activation gradient computation and that looks very much like inference, so I'm not going to show that here. And so what's happened with some recent works is that there's been uh, a line of research that looked at reducing the amount of non-zero flops in uh, CNN training. And what they've done is introduce sparsity in the uh, activation gradient, the activation, and the weights. And so this sort of sparsity is unstructured. And it's also two-sided. It happens in both of the inputs. Another feature of uh, this sort of sparsity is that it's dynamic. So from iteration to iteration and training, because we're training the weights, we're training the activations, uh, or we're changing the activations, um, the sparsity pattern also changes. So all these things present a big challenge in finding an architecture that can actually exploit the type of sparsity that we find here. Uh, so that leads us back to the other products. Again, we're not computing any of the zeros, so it works quite well uh, for this type of sparsity. And just by grabbing the values from the CSR, uh, we are able to adapt to dynamic sparsity. So that brings us to this next question. Why is it that RCPs dominate during training and not during inference? Uh, what I'll uh, notice here is that um, the amount of valid computation here is actually related to the size of the output of the convolution. Secondly, the total amount of computation is related to the size of the activation matrix. And so I've uh, 
we can estimate what's called an outer product efficiency. So how efficient is the outer product at computing the convolution just by dividing the size of the green matrix over the blue matrix. So let's put some numbers on this. So I pulled this from a ResNet. So for inference, we have a very small weight matrix and a very large activation matrix. You can think of it like, a, like an image that we're uh, sighing a filter over. And so this produces a very large activation for the next layer. And if we do the uh, outer product efficiency calculation, that's about 97%. Now, things are quite different for the weight gradient pass. We have very large matrices uh, that are being convolved together, and that produces a very small output. And then if we do the same computation, it turns out the efficiency is 0.07%. So that's saying that when we do the other product to compute this convolution, 99.93% of all the computation is redundant. So that's a huge inefficiency that we have to address. And uh, let's start by considering how did it detect these uh, redundant Cartesian products? So first let's consider the case of a single product. So a single uh, activation gradient element uh, represented with uh, indices SR and a single uh, activation element with indices XY. Now it turns out that this is one of many products here wherever there's overlap between the activation gradient and the uh, activation matrix. And all of these products you can sum together uh, to produce a single element in the output matrix. And so the position of this index is given by this equation Effectively, it's the offset between the indices of the two uh, matrices. Now, you might be wondering, how, does, how do these products relate back to the other product thing we were talking about? So it turns out that if we take a subset of these other products, they map onto this sort of overlapping uh, matrix uh, idea that I was talking about. So notice that this is kind of sparse, and that's because uh, um, the other product is a sparse computation. Now let's put some numbers on this. So it turns out that this maps to the 2, 1 coordinate of the output matrix. And we can uh, slide this up and compute the products up here. And that would map to the top left corner of the output matrix. Now the problem comes when we go too far up. So here, if we compute uh, these uh, offsets here, it turns out the output coordinate is negative. And so that's clearly not a valid output matrix coordinate. And so this is where we get RCPs. So the, all these products here are normally calculated by the other product, and they're all redundant. Same thing happens in the opposite direction. Four, five is outside of the output matrix. And so again, we get redundant Cartesian products. So the takeaway here is that just by computing these offsets here, we can figure out if a, a single product is going to be valid or redundant. So of course, we're not gonna be calculating uh, products one by one in hardware. Uh, we'd like to do things in parallel. And so that brings us to the anticipatory accelerator pipeline. So as core is this multiplier array, which I'll talk about in a, in a second. Um, but the idea is that you have these SRAM buffers with the indices and the values highlighted in green. And in between them, um, we've added this uh, additional combinational logic to figure out uh, what the indices are, and then which values to actually fetch from the SRAM buffers and actually feed into the multiplier array. So for example, in the first, uh, in this uh, first stage here, we're gonna figure out uh, the Y dimension of the output of the convolution. And then in this other stage, we're gonna figure out the X dimension. So now I'm gonna walk you through an example, but before that I do that, uh, I'm gonna explain the, the multiplier array. So what we're using is a bfold 16 multiplier systolic array. So each of these crosses represents a bfold 16 multiplier. And uh, in our evaluation, we use a four by four. So what that means is that we have four inputs from the top, four inputs from the left, and that produces 16 products every cycle. The example I'll, I'll give, we'll use a one by two multiplier to keep things simple. So in cycle one, we're going to use uh, these activation elements here and this activation element here. And that's going to compute uh, these two products here. So both of them are, are valid. And so we're going to keep that. 
Now in the second cycle, uh, it's going to produce one valid element and uh, one invalid. And because it produces a valid element, uh, that's going to be a, a valid cycle too. Now in the third cycle is when the hardware is actually able to uh, detect and actually eliminate these RCPs. So I'll kind of walk you through the sort of calculations that it would be doing. So uh, the output coordinate for the four here is a two zero and that lies outside of the output matrix. If we look at the six here, that would map to three zero, which is also outside of the output matrix. So in fact, in cycle three, we're gonna skip this computation and go directly to compute this. And so this is an example of how we're able to get speed up by doing in three cycles, all the valid computation instead of in four cycles. Uh, so I'll give you a sense of how this works at a larger scale. So at a four by four multiplier uh, with lots of RCPs, what we're do doing is actually limiting rows of computation where they're all RCPs. And so this eight uh, rows of computation gets condensed down to three rows. So if we then extend this and apply this to uh, entire convolutional neural networks, we get results like this. Uh, so what you notice is that for most of the convolutional neural networks, we get uh, over 4x uh, speed up and over 4x energy reduction, except for this little case of uh, VGG16. So, so the thing about VGG16 is it has many, many small layers and that makes it much harder to detect these RCPs and eliminate them. So what you can see here is that while most, mostly we're able to eliminate over 90%, in VGG's case, it's a little bit less. But the overall trend is, is good. So um, what you can see here is that the speed up and the energy reduction are correlated. And so we get this dual benefit from this architecture uh, and this is driven largely by uh, both reducing SRAM accesses while at the same time uh, reducing the, the values that end up going to the multiplier array. Uh, so in summary, I described uh, some of the characteristics of sparse training and that has called for an other product accelerator. The unfortunate thing is that that causes a redundant Cartesian products, but luckily we've designed this uh, anticipation accelerator that eliminates 90% of these redundant Cartesian products on average, and that results in 3.7x speed up and 4.4x less energy on average. Uh, thank you. I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Um, questions? Yeah, I think let me go in the order with which I saw the hands. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm Nandika Nayak. I'm um, a student at UIUC um, and I work with Chris Fletcher. Um, my question is about um, the addition phase of uh, the outer product accelerator. Um, so, obviously, the benefit, as you mentioned, of outer product accelerator is that then you can exploit um, sparsity in both the weights and the activations. Um, but the unfortunate thing is that because it's no longer output stationary, you produce a large amount of partial sums. Uh, and so I was wondering how you manage that. Yeah, thank you. Um, so so I, I'm sure you're familiar with maybe work like uh, SCNN and and that's sort of where our, uh, our anticipated accelerator is based on. Um, so, so really um, we're trying to extend um, and we're trying to solve a new problem with sparse training. And what we're saying here is that this is a problem that you're for sure gonna encounter with this other product, but there's definitely future uh, research that's possible in, in looking into how you can very efficiently uh, do these accumulation buffers and, and then uh, and another problem actually is like, for example, load balancing and DRAM accesses, like, like because the size of these matrices are so large, you're gonna need um, you know, additional work to figure out how to do this efficiently. Um, so, so really it's just sort of a starting point and, and really really hope that there's gonna be a lot of future work uh, in this direction. I think there was a question here, yeah. Um, hi, Ravish from Georgia Tech. Um, 
so my question is kind of a bit related um so your backward pass step is very like reduction heavy like right? you have a lot of additions happening when you convert that filter so uh, like my question was won't inner product be more efficient like uh, I, i just wanted to understand why you found outer product more efficient for that sir it's a question like how many more additions have to happen Oh. Yeah, uh that's a that's a great question. Um Right. Uh, I have a slide for this. Give me one second. Yeah, yeah, so we I mean this table is in the paper um but but what we did was we compared against a variety of classes of accelerators and we found that um a lot of them for example can only do one side of sparsity so they would miss out on the other half of the sparsity uh, another problem is that um they do some free computation based on this a fixed sparsity pattern which is not uh of something that you can do when uh in training the sparsity pattern is changing from iteration to iteration and so uh we're saying that we want to exploit all, all the sparsity that's available and so that's led us to this other product accelerator Um I acknowledge that there are other problems uh with that but I think this is a good first step to kind of show you know what's possible with this architecture. Thanks. So can I request the next speaker to start setting up? Um meanwhile we can have maybe one last question. So I think there's one here. Hello, uh this is Sonali from Penn State. Nice talk. Um I just had one question as to um does your work also consider activation gradient so because in the example you just showed us weight gradient so there is another um, set of backward pass computations happening so do you also consider that yeah absolutely in our evaluation we did all three passes of training um i didn't show the activation gradient just because it looks very similar to the inference uh computation in terms of the matrix sizes uh so sort of the same uh, inefficiency or efficiency of inference applies to the activation gradient okay thank you let's uh, thank our speaker again so the rest of the questions can be taken offline uh so moving on to the uh, third talk of this session so uh yunan andrew zang uh is currently a second year phd student uh, advised by hungwei sheng at uc riverside uh, his research focuses on tensor accelerators and accelerating applications using emerging hardware accelerators uh and the talk is titled uh, simd square a generalized matrix instruction set for accelerating tensor computations beyond gem so you can right is the microphone working Thanks for staying. Hello, um, I'm Andrew Zhang from UC Riverside, here to present our paper in D Square. Um, since this session is about learning, you might expect us to present another paper about machine learning accelerators. However, I'm here to present our latest work, which is in D Square. It can accelerate application beyond machine learning and AI. Simd Square is a new programming paradigm and architecture. Um, it can be easily extended through existing hardware simd square managed to um achieve a near 40 times speed up compared with conventional gpu with only 5% error overhead this work is cooperated with guan tai from nvidia and my advisor hong weizhen due to the increased demand of ai and machine learning workloads in recent years um A, a, a many academia researchers um industry leading chip designers and the cloud service providers bought us a set of accelerators including nvidia's tensor core google's tpu as well as the latest um intel performance core with the amx instruction support although they all advertise themselves as um machine learning accelerators if you look at their hardware and designing detail they are essentially matrix multipliers and the core function is to perform matrix matrix multiplication and matrices are everywhere as a digital representation it can be used to store images graphs or dna sequencing and etc 
In fact, if you browse your favorite matrix market, you will find out that almost every scientific area you can name right now uses matrices to store and process data. In being more specific, be more specific, there's many matrices with problems, including graph algorithms, dynamic programming, or relational database operations. And what we believe is AI and machine learning should not be the only focus of matrix hardware. We're living in a world where you know matrices and its hardware are everywhere. And um, have you ever wondered if we've been able to leverage or extend those hardware that designed for AI and ML to support more matrix-based problems? Well, in the rest of this talk, I will show you an example that motivates this research direction, as well as an exemplary architecture that supports it. I will also show you the emulation result that reveals a near 40 times speed up. Um, then I will conclude the talk. Solving the all pair shortest path is a classic graph problem. Well, with the input matrix, we want to find the shortest path between each pair of vertices. With a graph with four vertices, we can use a four by four adjacency matrix to represent the connectivity and the path width between each pair of vertices. And the, one of the algorithms we can use to solve this is called all pair Brillman fold algorithm, which is a matrix based algorithm that takes two inputs. One is the original adjacency matrix and another is the intermediate result, which in the very beginning is just a duplicate of the adjacency matrix, represents the shortest path with only zero half connection. Well, to compute the next iteration, meaning that we want to find a not only path with the additional half connection, we need to fetch a row and a column from the input matrices. What we need to do is we need to compare the sum between each pairs with the original value in the corresponding cell. Where in this case, we want to find if there exists a shorter path between vertex one and vertex two. And obviously you can find that the path using vertex three as the middle stop uh, which is 216 plus 265, that is 481, is the minimum value among all other sums and is also less than the original value 602. Therefore, we store 481 back to the result matrix. And for every other cell, we need to do the same row column operation. If this process looks extremely familiar to you, then you're right. The data flow of the all pair Berman fold algorithm is actually the same as matrix multiplication. And the only difference is instead of, instead of using the minimum reduce and the sum operation, matrix multiplication uses the sum and the multiply to update the value in the result matrix. If the animation was not clear enough, we can also check the code. Firstly, let's zoom into the inner three for loop of the all pairs women fold algorithm, but then we can slightly rewrite the code. If we compare this code with general matrix multiplication, you'll find out that both algorithms has the same three nested for loop structure, and they has the same pattern to access the rows and columns. And um, they both apply two-step operation onto the data. Another thing might not be trivial is both algorithms can be tiled and parallelized in the exact same way. Now, in GEM, if we define the sum or the add operator as the first operator and the multiply as the second operator. Similarly, in all pair Berman fold algorithm, we can define the mean operator as the first operator, the plus operator as the second operator. The algebraic structure of those two algorithms are essentially the same. In fact, all pair shortest pass problem is not the only case. Pyro work indicated that it, there exist many other matrix problems sharing the same data flow as matrix multiplication. We selected a total of eight pairs of operator where each represent a matrix problem. For example, if we use the max operator as first operator and the plus operator as the second operator, we can solve the critical pass problem. Or if we use mean or max, as the first operator and multiply as the second operator, we can solve the minimum or maximum reliability pass problem. However, with only AI and machine learning accelerators, only matrix multiplication can be efficiently solved, while everything else on the list are left behind. Inspired by the similarity of different matrix problem, we propose MD Square, a new programming paradigm that can be efficiently supported through existing MM hardware. 
Now I'm going to talk about SIMD Square architecture from hardware perspective, all the way to how to use it to solve a for aforementioned matrix problems. Based on our observation, we propose the idea of SIMD Square as efficient expression of each matrix pro problem to the underlying hardware. For each aforementioned matrix problem, we provide a SIMD Square instructions for the programmers to use. Well, you may wonder what is the overhead when to pay to support all these different matrix instructions? Well, I'm gonna show you it is possible to feed in those instructions into existing hardware with reasonable overhead. Before we look at the SIMD square architecture, we can have a look on a um, exemplary MXU design. Well, a conventional MXU may look like this. It could contain an array of air use and to efficiently provide data input to all this air use, one of the input matrix is being broadcasted to multiple air use because of the intrinsic data reuse opportunity on matrix multiplication. Well, on the other hand, the output matrix is being accumulated to multiple air use before they've been stored back to the memory hierarchy. With this special structure organizing each processing element, conventional MXU actually handles matrix multiplication very efficiently. Now, Let's consider that all the SIMD square instruction having the same algebraic structure as matrix multiplication, it is not too hard to imagine what we need. Originally, the first and second operator only supports multiply and add. All we need to do is just add all required operator aside of the multiplier and the adders with adding few maxes to select which operators to use for the hardware. Um, the new fused instruction or say the processing element that supports this new field instruction can be organized in the exact same way as the conventional MXU. But now all aforementioned matrix algorithms or problems can enjoy the same performance as what matrix multiplication did. Similar to the way how we integrate um, machine learning accelerator, accelerators into modern architectures, we can apply the same changes to support SIMD square unit. Using conventional GPU as an example, uh, a couple of subcores reside in the SM and we have the MXU cooperates with vector processors. All we need to do is just replace the original MXU with the SIMD square unit. Such native and the minimum change can be applied onto any, any other architecture and systems. With the underlying hardware support, now let's have a glance onto the SIMD square program model. Using NVIDIA's Tensor Core as an example, that we have the MMA, WMMA name, namespace, which included five APIs for the programmers to use, where the MMA sync API is able to perform a small chunk of matrix multiplication. And with some tiling technique, we can use such API to perform large MM. Now, if we're trying to extend SIMD square on Tensor Core, the program model remains the same. We can use the same tiling technique or even finer optimization approach to implement the compute kernel, <clears throat> which in this case is the inner three for loop of the all pair bundle fold algorithm. The only difference is to pass in the additional opcode for the hardware to realize which pair of operators to use. Now let's move on to some of the inside of our experimental result. We use the free PDK45 and the synopsis compiler tool to examine the timing and area overhead of SIMD square unit. After extending all eight pairs of operator, SIMD square introduces 69% area overhead. Well, SIMD 69% may sound huge, but if we simply add eight different MXUs where each dedicated to one matrix problem, the area overhead can easily exceed 200%. According to a die photo, SIMD square unit only introduces 10% of the SM area. And in fact, that is only 5% of the total die area. The timing result shows that the extended MXU or the SIMD square unit reaches the same cycle time as the original MXU, which enabled our emulation method of using existing hardware to explore the potential performance of SIMD square unit. We micro benchmarked each set of SIMD square API compared with state-of-the-art GPU libraries. We selected input size ranging from 1K to 16K, while across all different operators and sizes, SIMD square 
achieves the speed up ranging from 7.9 times to 9.9 times. And we suspect there's extra help from fusing multiple instructions into one. For example, the min max, max min, and the or and operator avoids the structural hazard in the GPUs, GPU SM and result in, a, result in a much higher speed up. SIMD square also shows significant performance uh, on all these matrix problems. The blue bar here shows the performance compared with the state-of-the-art baseline. SIMD square is 60.9 to 8.3 times faster with speed up as large as 39 times. Well, you may wonder, do we really need SIMD square unit to support those SIMD square instructions? The green bar shows the answer of it. If we simply implement those SIMD square instructions using conventional GPU, not all of the matrix algorithm can work very well. The geometry mean shows slowdown when comparing with no, those non-matrix non -matrix based baselines. We further explore the potential of, of using sparse computation unit since the latest tensor core can support up to 50% of the sparsity on input matrices. As the initial look of the SIMD square model, we use the CRUSPAS Lie library to extend our emulation framework of using tensor core, I um, mean, sparse tensor core. Using sparse SIMD, SIMD square unit can improve the performance by up to 68 times with a geometry mean ranging from 13 to 16 X. Using sparse SIMD square unit is 1.6 to 1.9 times faster than the baseline SIMD square unit, which is actually a very close result according to the two times more throughput that NVIDIA reports on their sparse tensor core. For more results and insights, please check our paper. In conclusion, we believe that even matrices are the core representation of many other scientific area, but current matrix hardware and operations only work on a very limited domain. And we believe it's native and effective to extend those existing hardware because many matrix algorithms are sharing the same data flow as matrix multiplication. Overall, SIMD square achieves very good performance with only introduced 5% error overhead. This work cannot be done without the support from two NSF grants and the technical support from NVIDIA. Please check the GitHub um, for our artifacts and also visit our web lab website if you're interested in more of our research at ASCO. Um, I'd like to take questions now. Thank you. No, thank you for your talk. I'm um, Peter Tang from Meta. Uh, question, uh, it is, there's a well-known body of work that shows that you can do graph theory in terms of matrix linear algebra. So a lot of those maps to that area. But other than graph theory type of applications, what else uh, are notable examples where you can replace the, basically the arithmetic mean, you know, the, the ring and the, and the field of the arithmetic? Thanks for the question. Um, so one major area we think is definitely the graph, is the graph problems. But one of the application we choose in SIMD square application set is the all pairs L2 distance, where you want to measure the L2 distance between each point is in each points into two data sets. And actually that um Distance measurement or similarity measurement can be applied on to any other, say, cosine, sine, whatever you like when you do data analytics. Um, so graph is not the only um, domain, but it's one very important domain. Thank you for your really interesting talk. Uh, Grace Dean, UC Berkeley here. You've shown um, some really cool results for things that look dense, but a lot of these semi-ring operations that people do, um, like, like what Peter mentioned about graph algorithms, real life graphs often end up to be being pretty sparse. So do you have any um, insight into whether these techniques can be used for sparse accelerators or like, thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, so 
first I want to show is that um, one thing about the sparsity is that um, we do understand that many graph analytics analytics are focusing on very sparse graphs and very sparse data, but um, we do have some data showing that we um, there exist many different applications with different sparsity. And this work, we are focusing on sparsity around, we we'll say around 1%. And um, as uh, it's an uh, initial look of this program model, we do believe that the same changes can be applied down to sparse computation unit. And um, um, we are looking forward to, for doing a future work on that direction. I think, uh, last, one more last quick question. So. Hello, very interesting and useful stuff. I can think of many, many more applications that actually need this. I was wondering, uh, by the way, this is Gerasmus Yerogiannis from University of Illinois at Urbana-Sambain. I'm advised by Professor Joseph Torellas. I am wondering what would happen in the case that the additive operation of the semi-ring is not associative. Have you thought about those cases? Because there are aggregators, for example, in graph neural networks, where the uh, additive operation is not associative. Thanks for the question. And that's, I think that is very interesting. So don't want to make this too complicated for everyone else. I just want to say that um, SIMD square is, I don't think it's limited with those summary operations. And uh, there's more detailed implementation when handling those um, non simmering or simmering implementation. And I think we can bring this offline if you want to do more discussion. Uh, thank you. So this ends the session. I think we have the awards lunch. Uh, so see you all there. Thank you all for attending.